Tip and Craig asked me to speak about deacons today. And the best place to go to talk about deacons is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, those verses that Grant read for us. So if you wouldn't mind turning there, we're going to look through those uh, verses together. Just to give you some context to the text here, Timothy, a young evangelist, was left in Ephesus to restore order and purpose to the church there because the church had been disrupted by false teachers. And so after laying out the charge for Timothy in chapter 1, Paul goes on to give instructions about how to pray and the roles of men and women and proper doctrine and Christian behavior. And then he emphasizes in chapter 3 the importance of strong leadership and the people fit for that role of leadership. And he describes overseers in verses 1 to 7. And then in verse 8 to 13, he talks about deacons. Now, the word deacon is taken uh, directly from the Greek language, but generally it means servant. And most of the time in the New Testament, when that word is used, it's used in this general sense. If you skip down to chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul says to Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. That's the same word for deacon, but there it's used in that general way. The greatest among you shall be your servant, Jesus said. However, what Paul describes here is a special class of servants called deacons that are closely associated with the elders of a church. And you see that here in another verse, Philippians 1 and verse 1, as Paul is addressing the church there, the saints, the overseers, and the deacons. Essentially, deacons are appointed servants, men of character, who embody what it means to serve God by serving others. Deacons are appointed servants, men of character, who embody what it means to serve God by serving others. So we're going to answer three questions today. Who should serve, how they should serve, and why they should serve. Their qualities, their work, and their reward. So let's move on here to the first point here. Who should serve as deacons? So he gives a list of qualifications about the kind of man who is fit for this kind of work. So deacons have to possess certain qualities in order to accomplish the work that God has given them to do. And really, there are two main qualities. The first one is their character. What kind of a guy is he? And the second one is his life, in particular, his family, how he leads his family. So the first thing here is who should serve as deacons? Well, men who are respectable and blameless in character. And you see this list in verses 8 and 9. The first thing is he's supposed to be dignified. Now, this is a, uh, the kind of person that you would take seriously, that you would listen to. His character evokes respect and admiration from other people. And then he follows this with three prohibitions, three not statements. He's not double-tongued, meaning he's sincere. He's trustworthy in his speech. Because we know that our communication telegraphs our heart, what's in our heart, right? So it's important that this man has control over his own mouth. Now, this would obviously ap apply to any communication, right? What we put out there on social media and this kind of thing would also apply to this idea of being not double-tongued. Not addicted to much wine. Now, we understand that, why that would be, you know, a, 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 an important qualification. This would lead to an undignified lifestyle. But again, this isn't just talking about what someone drinks. It's talking about a lifestyle of self-control, of being sober-minded in general, and not greedy for dishonest gain. That is, the man has his priorities in order. He's not living for this world. He's laying up treasure in heaven. Now, whereas elders, if you look at verse 2, are to be able to teach, deacons have to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. When Paul talks about the mystery of faith here, that's a technical term that he uses to describe the gospel, the gospel message that was once hidden. It's now been revealed by the apostles and the prophets through the Holy Spirit. So a deacon then is one who's going to hold on to that. He's not going to let go of that. That's going to be at the center of his life, and he's going to hold it with a clear conscience. That is, he's deeply convicted about it, and he's obedient to that faith. He's, he's believing in it, and he's living it out. 
So, deacons aren't just custodians of the church. They are men who are mature in their faith. They know what God's Word says, and they live it out. They have a good reputation uh, are with you know, everyone around them, the people at work, the people in their neighborhood, and the people within the church. They should know that about them. So the second thing here is a deacon has to manage his own household well. And that's verses 11 and 12. We'll come back to verse 10 in a moment here. And the deacon's wife is just as much a consideration here. She has to possess the same character as her husband. She needs to be dignified like her husband. She can't be a slanderer, right? She has to be sincere in her speech. She also can't be addicted to much wine. She needs to be sober-minded. So she's to share in her husband's spiritual maturity. Because a husband and wife should rub off on each other in positive ways. So like her husband, she's, verse 9, faithful in all things. Now, Paul is not demanding perfection here, but the, I think the idea is that she's the type of woman who's dependable, who's trustworthy, who's faithful to Jesus. And then together, they're to manage their household well. They're to be raising children, obedient children, in verse 12. And it's easy, of course, to see why that would be an important thing. If a man is going to be serving and managing God's family in some capacity, he's got to prove that he can properly care for his own family. That makes sense. If he's going to be put in charge of tasks that concern God's house, his own house needs to be in order first and foremost. So, let's go back to verse 10. Men who are qualified should be appointed to service. They have to be tested, he says in verse 10. They have to be tested before they're appointed. Now, Paul doesn't mean that, well, before you become a deacon, you need to take this written exam. That's not what he's saying. Uh, the idea is that people should see that the guy already possesses this kind of character. He's already serving. He's already mature in Christ. He's, he's there at the assemblies. He's doing what he can do, what God has given him to do, uh, the, the, the skills and the gifts. He's putting those to work in God's service. So the point is, you don't appoint a guy to see if maybe he'll work out in the future. No, he has to prove that he's blameless, and then he's to be appointed. So how do you go about appointing deacons? Because this text doesn't really help us, <laughs> because it's, he's not telling Timothy to how to appoint deacons. He's telling Timothy what a deacon is. So we're not told exactly how to appoint them, but if we go to another text, Acts chapter 6, I think we'll see that this is to be done at least by the consensus of the congregation and under the oversight of the elders. This is the closest text we have to 1 Timothy 3 to determine at least some principles that we can apply in this process. Let's go to Acts chapter 6 quickly. And we'll read uh, verses 1 to 6. Acts chapter 6. And here the church is just kind of beginning. It's in the early stages, and it's growing, and it's becoming diverse. If you see there in verse 1, it's the disciples were increasing in number, but there was a complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the church is, has this diversity within it, and it looks like uh, some are receiving special treatment and others are being neglected. There's a problem, right? Well, what do the apostles do? The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said in verse 2, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, Holy Spirit, uh, and Philip and a number of other people to, to uh, work out that problem. So here are these special servants. They are appointed in the church in Jerusalem, and the apostles give specific qualities. The congregation choose these seven men. They didn't volunteer themselves, right? They choose these seven men who fit the description, and the apostles put them in charge of this special task, and they carry it out. Problem solved. Now, I understand the noun form of the word deacon is not used in this text. But the verb form is to serve tables. 
comes from the same root word as deacon. It's very similar to what we see in 1 Timothy 3. So the church selects men who fit the description, and if no objections can be raised, in other words, to use what Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 3, if they prove themselves blameless, well then, the elders should appoint them to manage certain tasks and meet the needs of the church. So those are the principles we can apply today in the appointment of deacons. Well, what are those tasks? What is the work of a deacon? Again, the New Testament doesn't specifically uh, say, but we can infer some principles based upon these two texts. Here's, I think, something important to consider between the difference between an overseer and a deacon. Whereas an overseer manages and is set over a congregation, deacons are to manage and are set over special tasks that serve that congregation. So we move on to the second point here, how should deacons serve? You know, you might read Acts chapter 6, what we just read, and think, well, deacons serve the physical needs of the congregation, and overseers or elders, they serve the, the spiritual needs of the congregation. And this might be true to a certain extent, but I think we need to be careful about distinguishing those two things and just relegating the deacon's work to a merely physical, you know, sphere. Remember, these guys are spiritually mature. They're full of the Holy Spirit and faith, right, who are in charge of this task. And the task itself, serving tables or probably like handing out food or, or you know, whatever the, the widows uh, would have needed, supplies or whatever, that may have been a physical thing that they were doing, but does that mean that it wasn't spiritual? Does that mean they didn't have love and faith in their hearts as they were doing this? Absolutely not. So we're not to think that serving tables is on a lower level than prayer and preaching. No, both things are necessary. Both things are necessary. I think the point from Acts chapter 6 is, the 12 apostles were called to preach and teach God's word. And caring for the widows would have taken them away from that task. Likewise, elders, Tip and Craig, they have a charge set before them. They have a specific role. But there is other work to be done, and it's important work, and it needs to be done. So this necessitates another group of men qualified to carry out that work. So deacons have a unique role that's different than the overseers. So how are they to work, and what kind of work might they do? Well, they should serve, first of all, with impartiality, not playing favorites. Do you see in Acts chapter 6, you had a, you know, a di disagreement here, or you had at least this divide within the church between the Hellenists and the Hebrew widows. So the church is diverse, and deacons have to manage projects in a way that doesn't favor any one group over another. So they've got to be unbiased. They have to be sincere people in their work to uphold the unity of the church. And what the gospel is preaching is that we're all coming to Christ together in one family and we're all equal. So they should serve with impartiality. They should serve with trustworthiness. Sometimes deacons are given money so that they can fulfill their task. That's why Paul says they're not to be greedy for dishonest gain. And so elders need honest reliable men they could depend on to manage those funds with integrity. So they need to be dependable. Not just always there when you need them, but they need to be trustworthy when you give them a task or when you give them money to complete that task. And then they serve with delegated authority. So the elders of a congregation would delegate authority to deacons. They are seeing the big picture. They're seeing the, what the needs of the congregation are, and then they're employing these deacons to go and accomplish that, that task. They're setting them over the task, and they say, here, you take this, you run with it, and I trust you to do it because you're qualified. So what does that mean, deacons? That the elders shouldn't have to be micromanaging everything. They trust you over the task that you've been appointed to go and carry that out. And because you're, you know, if you meet these qualifications, then, then you are fit to do the work. Well, most of us aren't deacons, right? So, you know, what can we do to encourage the deacons? Well, a couple of things. First of all, a lot of the work that deacons do is behind the scenes. And it's not the stuff, you know, you're looking at me right now, right? And that's very, I'm, like, that's visible, right? Because I'm in front of you. 
But a lot of the work that the deacons do is behind the scenes. You never even really notice it if you're not paying attention. Start paying attention. There's work that is done behind the scenes. Recognize and respect the value of that work because it's really important. Everything that the deacons do here at Dulles is contributing to the overall strength, health, unity of this family. And so you need to recognize that. Without the deacons, the work wouldn't get done. And then, of course, that leads to the next thing, show gratitude, right? The reason why we have online streaming services, why we have children's Bible classes and materials and helps for teachers and, and the building is in good order and, and the assemblies are run smoothly and all we have a podcast and so much more, that's because deacons are doing that work and they're overseeing that work. And then the third thing here is, obviously, help them. Help them accomplish that work. When was the last time you went to one of our deacons? You went to maybe like Lawrence and said, Lawrence, I know that you are kind of overseeing the, the overall, you know, uh, state of the building here, you know, the construction of the building and making sure everything's in good working order. What can I do to help you? Because he can't be there all the time to do everything, right? Deacons are not left to do this work alone. No, they're to see that the work gets done. So the rest of us should be asking, how, I can, how can I help you so that you have all the resources you need to get the job done? And I know a lot of you guys are already doing that. You're going out to the store, you're picking up things that we need, right? Or you're, you're making sure this class is being taught or whatever. You're already doing that. But, you know, others, we need to pitch in as well. All right, lastly here, their reward. Why? should deacons serve? Well, obviously they should serve because the services they provide are crucial, right? Acts chapter 6, it needed to get done. There was a need. It needed to be filled. And without these men, it wasn't going to get done. You know, by the grace of God, this church is growing. But with that growth comes greater complexity and new challenges that we're faced with and unique needs. And God knows that we need men who are willing to do that work for his glory and set a positive example of serving God by serving others. The second reason here is right there in verse 13. It's to gain a good reputation with others. When deacons serve faithfully, Paul says they gain a good standing for themselves. They gain a good standing for themselves. The word standing literally means a step. That is, figuratively, they gain a position of influence and reputation in the community and in the church. Now, don't misunderstand Paul. Paul is not talking about gaining rank in the church. That has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Rather, what he's saying is when deacons emulate Jesus, who came to serve and not to be served, they are preaching the gospel with their lives. They are influencing others for good. And I think this is what made Johnny such a great deacon. Johnny was such a good example of what all deacons should strive for. Not only did he do his work faithfully and reliably, he did it with great honor and dignity for the Lord. He was never looking for a pat on the back. He was never looking for an attaboy. He did it as a reflection of God. That's why he did it. And not, not for any kind, of, any kind of recognition. And yet, everybody who knew him respected him. Every single person had regard for that man. The people in his neighborhood, the people at his job, and the people here at Dulles. So you gain a good, that's part of the reward. In doing the work well, you gain a good reputation. And then you gain great confidence before God here. Um, so these two commendations, a good reputation with others and great confidence toward God and your salvation and Jesus on the other, that's the reward of those who serve well as deacons. So what can we do? What can we do as members of this congregation to ensure that we continue to have deacons here? Men, strive to be servants, not only because the work is important, not only because the, these needs need to be uh, met, but because these qualities outlined by Paul here, with the exception of having a wife and kids, that's expected of every single Christian. So we should be striving to be these kind of people. Well, how can we develop into true servants? 
I'll tell you how, you serve. <laughs> you serve your wife and your kids if you have them first. You serve the people around you first. Women live a life worthy of respect and dignity. What he says here of wives is also true of all Christian women. And children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is pleasing to God. So God wants every local congregation to function as a family, to care for one another's needs, to encourage, to serve one another as the household of God. And God has designed the local church uh, to provide each one of us with the best atmosphere of spiritual growth. And deacons are a crucial part of God's design. Now, obviously, not all of us can be deacons, but we must all be servants, taking our lead from Jesus. Remember what he said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. So are you a servant? Are you serving other people? You know, Jesus is our example in everything, right? And he poured out his life in faithful service to God for us. And his sacrifice, if it means anything to us, should motivate our behavior. And it's with that we offer his invitation. He came down from earth. He is the king of creation. And yet he went to the people who were hurting and he showed compassion to them. And he gave his life as an offering for your sin and for my sin on the cross. And if you need the prayers of this church or if you want to even be baptized today into Christ Jesus and be part of this wonderful family, then we urge you to come forward as we stand and sing.